Hello. Uh, I've, I'm going to talk to you today about um, escape room designs and how that applies to the world of VR. Um, but before we get into that, uh, I'm going to show you one of my favorite videos from the internet. And I, I just love this video so much because to me, um, it's a really great example of pure play. You know, that dog is thinking of nothing except how good it feels to roll down that hill and how quickly it can get back up there to do it again. Uh, and the reason that I think that's so cool um, as an example of play is that humans get to feel that way too when we are engaging in play. It's kind of a magical feeling, right? And humans love magic. Uh, another dimension of fun that also feels like creating and experiencing magic comes from storytelling. Um, storytelling lets you get carried away. You can forget yourself, become a different person in a different place. It excites you, it makes you feel things. In short, stories transport people. And we're inevitably going to tell stories using whatever technology we have on hand to do it. As much as popular media, though, likes to warn us against a future where we're all in cubicles operating little digital facsimiles of ourselves, the truth is that a side effect of our relationship with screen-based entertainment is that the value of in-person experience begins to rise. Uh, and that's something you can see in the increasing popularity of board games, people who are returning to like RPGs as a way to spend time with their friends, um, and, and media that reflects that with podcasts of uh, Dungeons & Dragons games and so on. But really, this is nothing new. People always have and always will crave experiences no matter where they're coming from, right? Because you want to feel that sense of magic, transportation, connection with other people. It's all of the things that make our experience as human beings pleasurable. As video game designers and filmmakers, we're very familiar with the mental side of that, right? The language and mechanics that go into constructing stories for people to consume. Um, there's another field as well, known as experience design, that focuses on designing for the physical, real-world side of things, um, which includes theme parks, haunted houses, immersive theater, and most recently, escape rooms. Uh, they're all disciplines that explore the use of space, human agency, uh, the interaction between viewer and story. They're all things where people are physically moving through a space and being uh, told a narrative of some kind and absorbing information as they do so. Uh, here you can see um, some of the best examples in that field. <laughs> uh, the, the kind of noted best dark ride is at Tokyo Disney. Um, the, the best, in my opinion, immersive theater performance is Sleep No More in New York, and then that's my escape room on the side. <laughs> I'm just teasing, I'm teasing. VR, though, has the potential, oops, excuse me, to contribute, uh, or to combine both of those worlds. And we're really just at the start of understanding where that can go. Uh, even more exciting, we can use VR to make a new language that takes into account the physical body, the cognitive processes of the brain, and the new methods of design that must emerge when we begin to take, um, take into account the human subconscious. When that is working, we can make magic happen for people, and people will always and have always wanted that thing. I'm, I'm Laura Hall, uh, I live in Portland, Oregon, and I currently design escape room games. Uh, you might have guessed from the session title. Um, but before that, I was really, really interested in alternate reality games um, known as ARGs. Uh, those are sort of interactive, real-time stories that played out online. They usually involved a lot of puzzles. You would interact with characters. There's like a whole writing team behind the scenes. And so it was all happening in real time. You'd send an email to a character, one would come back, and, and the story would end up changing around you as the characters interacted with the players. Um, so it was this really cool ephemeral thing happening as well. Even before that, I was really interested in MUDs, multi-user dungeons, which are just like multiplayer text-based adventure games. Um, 
the one that I played was very interested in facilitating culture and politics. And so it ended up being, for me as a, a high schooler, basically like a four year long real time interactive novel where all of my friends also hung out. So now, you know, those, those have sort of phased out. Um, and I'm, I'm now interested in escape room games and immersive theater and so on. But I like to think about what it was that drew me to all of these experiences. Because to me, they actually um, clearly share a lot of the same DNA. Uh, and it's that magic stuff that I was talking about. The, the transportation, the sense of connection with other people, the ability to sort of forget yourself and become truly immersed in some other world. Uh, and right now, you know, I'm, uh, again, I'm super interested in escape rooms, but I'm also really, really thinking about VR because I think that the same sort of appeal is there. Uh, it has really incredible potential to speak to those same fundamental desires. All of those games that I used to play also shared another thing in common, which was puzzles. Um, puzzles are fun, they're challenging. Sometimes it's just as much about you versus the puzzle as it is you versus your own cleverness. Um, I love this quote, people solve puzzles because they like pain, they like being released from pain, and they like most of all that they find within themselves the power to release themselves from their own pain. So that's kind of incorporating all of these things that I really think are relevant to spatial design. It's the physical, it's the cognitive, uh, and, and it's you know, the player's sense of agency within that context. And puzzles and games really do have a long history together. Um, escape room games are a very specific type of puzzle meets environment, but puzzles can be almost anything. Uh, it could be falling blocks, it could be logic puzzles, obstacle courses, plumbing. Uh, and if you want to look at it a little more abstractly, lots of games use mechanics of withholding or gating information or access, asking players to work toward opening up whatever that avenue is. Um, it could be as simple as collecting objects for a quest to unlock a dungeon door. It can be much, much more elaborate, but that's, I mean, that's a puzzle in, in a way. Um, so long story short, puzzles are a very useful technique for moving people forward in gameplay. In the early 90s, uh, we kind of entered a golden age of puzzles and games as, as technology was really um, available to facilitate these sort of things, uh, including Myst, Secret of Monkey Island, Return to Zork. Um, and if you're familiar with any of those, you'll know that the puzzles in those tend to have like a fairly distinctive flavor of the era, I guess. It um, often means trying to pair every object together to see what works. Um, it's not always necessarily with like a real world logic, uh, which it, you know might tell you what to do with what other thing, which can make it hard to guess, but it ends up being funny as a result of the sort of absurdity of it. Then in the late, uh, late double aughts, you started to see a new sort of puzzle game emerge um, as Flash started proliferating around the web. Um, the one shown here is uh, the first or maybe the most famous like digital escape the room game of that time. It's called Crimson Room um, by Toshimitsu Takagi from 2004. Uh, locked rooms as, as puzzle sort of scenarios have always existed in like detective stories, right? It's impossible mysteries based on who had or didn't have access to that space. Um, but these games actually place you in the room itself rather than on the outside looking in and trying to deduce what was going on. Uh, in Crimson Room, you can see, you click around, you turn over the edges of pillows, you shake the curtains um, in a sequence that eventually allows you to escape from that locked room. And there's a, you know, a few in this series um, and many imitators. Then somebody had the very brilliant idea of actually building one of these in real life. Um, and that's when escape games began uh, to come onto the scene. As you might imagine from seeing that Flash version, uh, escape room games are real life games which players are locked inside a room um, and that's almost the only sort of constraint that there is. It can be anything beyond that. You know, generally they have to investigate, poke around, uncover clues, solve puzzles, sometimes even physically escape from restraints, um, usually while racing against a clock. They started out in Europe and Asia. Um, Scrap Entertainment, which has a huge branch here and is really fun. Uh, they opened in Japan, though, in um, the sort of mid-double aughts, and then in the US in 2012. Um, and as I said, these have a lot in common design-wise with theater, haunted houses, museums, theme parks, 
there are established best practices that we can see there, um, as well as in things like video game level design. Anything where you're moving people forward in a narrative, directing their attention. Um, one distinguishing factor for escape room games is the use of puzzles, of course, but, but also specifically the time constraint. Uh, in, a, in a haunted house, your experience is usually very brief because they're trying to move people through while balancing um, the number of people that are actually in that space at one time. It's supposed to never, you're never supposed to have the line of sight of another patron. Um, and theme parks obviously are very tightly timed, but you are not aware of the time constraint yourself. These real world builds are physical manifestations um, of what had previously been 2D in the, in the case of these suddenly new escape room games. Um, and the challenge that escape room designers face is often in translating puzzles and components that had been entirely digital into the physical realm. Also for an audience that was probably more used to those digital versions than the now physical ones. So I want to talk to you about puzzles for a minute before we get deeper into stuff so that you sort of understand the fundamental building blocks of what that experience is like. Uh, ideally, a well-designed physical puzzle is a combination of bodily interaction with whatever the puzzle object is, there's the cognitive challenge, and there's also the subconscious design cues of the object itself that tell you how to work on it, how to solve it, how to interact with it. Um, so to understand how to design one, I'd like to show you first how players approach solving them. Um, puzzle solving is an exercise in observation, first and foremost. You have to assess exactly what information you have at any given time, how it might work together with other pieces of info you've uncovered, and, and continue from there. Uh, this is a clip of Curtis Chen, puzzle designer, founder of Puzzled Pint, which is an awesome monthly puzzle solving event uh, that's in a lot of cities all around the world now. It's from a talk about how to solve any puzzle in under 47 minutes. Um, and so for, for context, players were given an envelope that contained a huge pile of postage stamps, and that was it. There was no instructions, there's no guidelines, no labeling of any kind. Uh, the players of this game knew that it would be self-contained. All the information they needed would be in or on those stamps somehow. Um, so here is how an experienced puzzler uh, would approach that challenge. We have here 44 stamps in 16 different denominations from half a cent up to 29 cents, and they're all canceled with a postmark. So let's start by grouping them by denominations, by the set value. And one thing we notice is that no group has any more than four stamps in it. Now the next thing, if you look at the designs, every design tells you what year the stamp was issued in. It's either an anniversary of something, or commemorative, or an Olympics. So we can order the stamps within each group. Now some of them don't have years. But that's actually not going to matter, as we'll see in just a few seconds. So let's, this is just the last few groups, and let's take a close look at those top two rows, the 15 and 20 cent stamps. Now they've been ordered, so we've used some of the information already. So what's left? Well, we've got the postmarks. And there are two different kinds of postmarks here. There are the circular ones, and then the wavy lines. So we have circles and lines, dots and dashes. Morse code. Morse code, right? That's so cool. Like you, you would have no idea just looking at that thing on the left that that was actually an act, true message, which is the thing that's revealed on the right. So it was that solution when it was translated um, gave those puzzlers the next location to go uh, to pick up the next puzzle in that challenge. And that's a pretty great example of steps that a player should be going through, um, how they're mentally and physically engaging with the game pieces in order to solve it. Um, you assess, you organize, you look for patterns, determine what information has or has not been used, and then assess again. And then a, a, as well, a good puzzle tells you inherently in its design how it should be solved. Um, I should also note that puzzle difficulty is adjusted upward or downward by how much information is given to the player at one time. This is a very difficult puzzle because there's no context, there's no instructions whatsoever. But you could make it a little bit more easy by, I don't know, grouping them already into small, small groups or, or uh, providing some sort of uh, instruction as to the order. Um, it's just a matter of nudging people as much as they need to based on their ability. Um, so knowing that's how a player approaches the solve, uh, I'll show you how one is constructed. Um, I'll walk you through a puzzle I designed for an athletic shoe company. Uh, the puzzles for this needed to be physical, 
to incorporate um, teamwork and cooperation, to speak to the brand messaging, and also ideally to utilize uh, physical components of the shoes and other exercise equipment. So for context of this one, there were a variety of puzzle types in the room that players uh, had never encountered before. Um, some of them required physical tasks, some were connecting the dots, some needed them to use their phone to look up information on the internet, uh, some were based on visual perspective. So there's meant to be a sort of balance of skills being used. Because this was for a party that people had been invited to without being told what they were going to encounter when they arrived. Probably also none of them had done a puzzle room before. Uh, this, you know, that, that was just not really the audience. Um, so they needed to be simple enough that they didn't require a ton of instruction, but also still be fun. Uh, and that's, that's a kind of tough challenge. Um, the way that I approach that solution, incidentally, is by making it a speed run challenge rather than a countdown clock. Um, so for this puzzle, players encountered a huge pegboard with colored pegs. Um, they get these stretchy resistance bands from a different puzzle in that room. Some are already arranged on the board itself when they first encounter it. Uh, and, and to make it clear, um, the color of the bands matches the color of the pegs. Also in the room are these two boxes, uh, buttons. They all have a variety of words written on them, which inside the room looks like this. Pegboard on the left, the buttons are on the right to either side of the door. The solution for that puzzle is to get the keyword from that pegboard, which is on one button box, uh, and a keyword from another puzzle, which is on the other button box. Pushing both buttons at once requires coordinating with your team, and that's what opens the final door. It's the last step. So as I said, when players encounter that board, uh, and you can kind of see there, it already has some shapes of the letters on it. And that's because if we didn't provide any information at all, it would look like this. Colored pegs only, no context whatsoever, and impossible to actually solve because there's no true letter shapes in there. And technically that's not exactly true because you can sort of make out the shape of a Y on the end. Uh, the solution word for this, by the way, is energy. Um, there's only one button on any of those boxes that ends in a Y. So if you were really, really stuck and also really, really observant, you could maybe make that connection, but that's not fun. So here's the arrangement that people actually encountered when they came into the room for the first time. Uh, it's suggestive of some of the more complicated letters like the R, but if you're in a hurry, not paying super close attention, it's not very revealing. And this is a different example of how the board could have been arranged to make it a degree of difficulty further, uh, because the R here is arranged on the yellow pegs using a yellow band. You're telling them in the design to match colors. But by putting wrong colored bands on pegs, like the I and the T, you're throwing them off in a pretty serious way. Uh, to arrange it in this way suggests an alternate six-letter word, which may, you know, maybe it's spirit or something like that. But you're priming them from the beginning to see only that one word. Uh, even if they remove them, it would be really pretty difficult to sort of circle back and come to the correct solution. So since this room was built for people who had never encountered a puzzle room before, and again, who came to that event really not knowing what they were about to get themselves into, uh, it couldn't have this many layers of encoding, because in that context, it wouldn't be fun. But in a different room situation, I think I would really enjoy inflicting this on some players. <laughs> um, so that's just one thing to keep in mind uh, if, you know, if you're introducing puzzles or anything like that into your game design. Keep in mind what the player knows, what's reasonable for them to know. That stamps puzzle, for example, requires you to be able to recognize Morse code. Uh, I wouldn't expect somebody off the street to be able to just like make that leap, but for the people who enjoy playing those sort of lengthy games, like that's a pretty straightforward and almost basic level solve. Um, part, part of this, though, is an inherent understanding of how interactions with the objects are supposed to work. Like in Monkey Island, it's pretty hilarious to try X with Y until you finally figure out how everything fits together and it makes sense with the comedic tone. But in a situation where you're racing against a clock, suddenly being stumped in that way is much less appealing. In our escape room, we always tell people that having fun is the goal. Nothing in there is meant to thwart you or prove somehow that you're bad at puzzles. Um, because to me, it's very, very important to always be building an experience that lets people challenge themselves first and foremost. But there's actually a very long way to go before we reach that point in any design, physical or digital. Uh, when we're designing any kind of experience, there are a lot of questions we have to ask ourselves up front. 
uh, one of which is, what are we actually asking the player to do? Because in a real life space, it's not quite as simple as run through this level, because they might literally be running. Um, and in a real life escape the room game, you're usually standing the whole time. So there's actually a major physical demand when you're in a real space. And the same applies to VR, room scale VR in particular. Um, but you may be asking people to stand, crouch, crawl, wave their arms around. Um, even just standing for an hour is really pretty tiring, especially if you're giving a talk while you're doing it. Um, but in escape rooms, we have to be really mindful of the physical strain on the player. Uh, we often will put a chair in there in case people need to rest. So this is the first lesson for VR as well. Even though we're working within a world that has infinite design possibilities when that headset is on, there are true limitations to the physical realities of what we can ask the human body to perform. Uh, the movie Minority Report is one of the best and most obvious examples of this. Um, there's tons of writing about the way that it's like poorly ergonomically designed uh, and bad, bad UI. Um, but in, in the film, Tom Cruise needs to comb through lots of evidence of a crime. So he throws it up onto a huge transparent screen. He controls it with a series of complicated hand gestures. Uh, and it looks like he's conducting an orchestra while he's doing it. It's really very beautiful. But it's not real, uh, and frankly, should never be real. Um, on that movie set, you know, he, it was rumored that he had to constantly rest between takes. Um, and if a man as professionally fit as Tom Cruise gets tired doing that, there's really no hope for the rest of us. Um, that fatigued condition of interacting with a screen that's in front of you is known as gorilla arm, by the way. Um, it's why you generally only encounter vertical touch screens without like, a physical support like a table for interactions that are short term, like a map at an airport or at an ATM. Uh, in my own case, when the Valve Lab stuff came out, I spent a really, really long time um, playing the archery and spaceship arcade games. They're super fun. But when I came out of those sessions, my arms really hurt because I was having so much fun in it that I really didn't actually know that I was doing like hours worth of arm exercise. Um, I forgot the demands on my own body. And it was only after when I emerged uh, and taking off the headset that I was reminded of that in a very real way. <laughs> But I actually think that's kind of cool, too. Um, something really special happens to people's bodies when they set foot into an escape room or any other physical kind of build. Uh, it's something that you see in other fields of experience design, especially haunted houses and immersive theater. The lights are dark. Players go into it not knowing what to, it, what to expect. Uh, in that situation, you're kind of entering survival mode. Like your heartbeat increases, your adrenaline rises, and your fo focus gets very, very narrow, um, along with the selective attention that comes with that. And, and you're essentially entering into what we call the flow state. Um, in a non-game context, in, uh, inducing the flow state from scratch, like when you sit down at your desk and try and make yourself be creative, is really, really difficult. Um, and it's the same for professional athletes. It requires a lot of skill and training and showing up at the same time every day and a lot of drudgery to be able to get to that point where as soon as you can or you need to call upon it, you can. Um, most people you know, don't have that sort of patience and training. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually very difficult. So as any creative person knows, sometimes it just doesn't happen. Being able to induce that feeling for novices through environment and gameplay, I think in a way is a gift to them. Uh, but there's another side to this as well. Um, emergency responders will work in pairs when they're in the field because it's very, very easy for everything around them to sort of fall away completely as they're working, uh, which can put them in danger. Like they might not notice a building about to fall on them. They just, you know, they're so intensely focused on dealing with whatever is at hand that they can't concentrate on that. So you always have a second pair of eyes. Or sometimes they'll work themselves into a state of exhaustion because they don't notice the time is passing. So that's known as time dilation. And it's also a super real and potentially dangerous problem for VR experience as well. Uh, this is a quote from the Voices of VR podcast by Kent Bai, which is awesome and I highly recommend everybody listen to. Um, I've had some really weird experiences where I've gone into VR and thought I played for three hours, then came out and realized I had been in there for 12 hours. I've had that happen a couple of times. Uh, 
That person who's speaking is a member of the VR community. He's an early adopter of technology. He understands the tech and the design of it. And even for somebody like that, he can lose time in such a significant way, which actually is a little scary. Uh, he, he specifically mentions that it's a tower defense game, which is designed to keep you playing. Um, so perhaps not the best match for that medium for this exact reason. Um, in escape room games and, and all of these other sort of experiences, you have a timer or you're entering into the experience knowing how long you'll be there. But in VR headsets, you often have no external cues to indicate how much time is passing. So we really need to be good stewards of the flow state uh, when we're working to deliberately induce it in people through our design. However, that narrowed focus from the flow state can be useful and positive when it comes to design as well. Uh, other elements of the human brain are less about the responsibility that you have for the player's body, their physical needs, their limitations, and more about manipulating them for fun. <laughs> That's your fun and theirs as well. Uh, so I want to talk for a minute about what's happening to players mentally when they're in an escape room. They know they're, uh, we know they're in survival mode. They're excited. We've used lighting cues and design to sort of bring them into that flow state. So what does it mean to design for that state of their brain? Uh, I'm going to show you a video. It's very important that you follow the instructions on the screen carefully. Maybe. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? So that's more generally known as the invisible gorilla experiment. Um, and it's a very good example of how brains and bodies do really weird things in concert when you're in a stressful situation, like being asked to concentrate on something specifically. And it's that survival mode thing. Um, you see this play out in escape rooms all the time. In ours, we have a hint screen uh, that has a siren that blares anytime we send a message through. It's very, very loud. Uh, it's, it's like pretty prominently placed in the room. And you would think it would be very hard to miss, but it really, people miss it all the time. They're so deeply engrossed in whatever's going on that there's somebody sitting behind the scenes jamming a button constantly until somebody sort of sticks their head up and turns over to look at it. Uh, another funny lizard brain survival mode thing uh, is that we love to look for patterns. Um, so does this sink look worried to you? <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, also playing is something known as the hider simile illusion, which is a demonstration of how people will come up for a narrative for something simply because it's so easy to read into it. Yeah. Oh no. Uh, the long story short is that we love to read too much into things. <laughs> yeah, that, I think that circle's in trouble. Um, so basically, in, in situations like this, we're so focused on stuff that we're actually very distracted. We're processing so much information so quickly that we're seeing things that aren't there, which is actually really exhausting, uh, not physically, but in your mind. Um, it's a real thing called brain fatigue. We only have so much processing power in there before we need to sort of recharge our batteries. Uh, that power is being spent very, very quickly when you're throwing a lot of stuff at people or asking them to engage as deeply as you do in, in puzzle situations. Um, it's also why when you're purchasing a car, you're sometimes given lots and lots and lots of customization options right up front. All the stuff that's expensive by default comes later in that process when you're too tired to fight it off anymore. So yeah, what's happening inside people's brains? They're deeply focused to the exclusion of other information. They're quickly searching and processing to try and make connections. And they're getting mentally exhausted by what they're seeing and doing. But most importantly, they're probably not noticing that that's happening. 
luckily for all of us, there's a huge world of design principles and best practices uh, to help us deal with these quirks of the brain. They also help us to answer another larger question, which is what do we want people to feel? For me, it's very important that they feel enjoyment, uh, but also a sense of engagement, a mental immersion in whatever the experience is, because my particular interest is in narrative stuff. Um, I like for them to feel a spatial presence, uh, and, and as well the transportation, uh, the losing of oneself, the sense of oneself, your identity. That's not necessarily inhabiting another character, um, but it can be. And, and something to keep in mind as well, our brains are always searching for reasons to identify something as stranger out of place, another survival mechanism. Uh, so you have to play with the level of the suspension of disbelief that you're, you're willing to provide uh, and that people are willing to give to you, um, as well as speak to them unconsciously in how your environment is set up and how they're performing in it. Building real life stuff is actually really hard. <laughs> um, but even though we're instinctively searching for odd things out, People fundamentally want to be entertained, so they're very, very forgiving. They want to be drawn into the illusion. Now, this is a great quote from a theme park designer um, discussing the suspension of disbelief that happens in a theater, and it's because you're so familiar with the context. Uh, when, as soon as you walk in and you sit down, you know what to expect and you sort of slip into that mode. It happens in a movie theater, it happens in an, a theater with actors. Uh, we, we are primed by the environment to know what to expect. So in this context, um, understanding cognition and processing load guided us in our, our escape room design, the first one that we made, um, about the environment and what was going to be placed in it, with the ultimate goal of never breaking the illusion for people. Uh, world building, diegesis, and internal logic is a very good way to ground people when their cognition and physical capabilities are, are being overloaded. Because you're relying on the players to build a mental model of the world, as, as reflected in this quote, uh, you're providing as much indication of that world as possible externally and in your design. Um, so what are they familiar with? Uh, this is where looking to other media, physical and otherwise, that shares quality with escape rooms comes into play. Um, haunted houses, theatrical design, and so on. But cinema and television in particular have a language that we're all very familiar with. The use of high or low camera angles to convey power or weakness, for example. Um, but the backgrounds of these, uh, dressed by set decorators and production designers, consistently convey specific notions of time, location, space, quality, and character. The way a person has folded their clothes neatly or kicked them under their bed like reveals a lot about that person. Um, ideally, nothing is placed in a movie frame by accident because people are absorbing it all, all the time. So I want to ask you, what does an office look like when you say an office? What, is it, what picture do you have in your mind, right? It's maybe fluorescent lights, messy desk, filing cabinets, may, probably not too pleasant. Um, might be better designed, you could have a cool desk, a plant, or like maybe dogs work in your office or hang out. Um, but it's still a place where work is happening. So there's a lot of utilitarian stuff going on, like messes of cables, like piled up mail, inboxes, that kind of stuff, kind of stressful. Um, offices in film and television are often the same. Wor the workers in the show, the office, have small beige desks that are cluttered uh, to sort of convey how like dreary their jobs are. And you can compare that to offices in films that we had looked at for design inspiration, uh, which represented some of the story themes we wanted to exemplify uh, about paranoia and sort of dystopian uh, environments. Um, here we have Brazil, which often has desks placed into massive, massive group areas, the open office plan that we all dread, uh, but 10 times worse. They have magnifying screens because their actual uh, physical technology is too small. You can see here he's sharing a desk with somebody through the wall, so they have this tug of war going. Um, next is The Lives of Others, which is about a Stasi officer who's eavesdropping on people. Um, so you can see still like very utilitarian and minimalist, but, but quite stylized. Uh, and then also an actual Stasi office um, with a kind of light color palette in a, a sort of surprising way from what my mental picture had been. Um, so based on the, looking at those inspirations, this is what we sort of came out with. Sparse furnishings, theatrical directed lighting, propaganda posters, um, bonus ducts as a reference to Brazil. Um, banks of technology. And we knew that these were the sort of things you would expect to find in an office of that type, 
and use that expectation to deliberately evoke a sense of otherworldliness, oppression, a distance in time with the use of like older technology, maybe an economical sparseness, without ever explicitly stating anything about that world in words. Um, the color palettes of the films that were on the previous slide also dictated the choices that we made uh, in, in that and other sort of visual design. We used mostly greens and yellows. You can see a little bit of red here in the environment and in the poster, but in the entire room, there's only one object that's red, which is indicative of a puzzle solution. And by isolating it in that way, it meant that the design intent was clear for the solution. Uh, and we were kind of pleasantly validated by a film that came out after we had created our room called The Double, which is set in a similarly dystopian sort of world uh, and used almost the exact same colors, lighting, and mood. So that was nice. Uh, one other thing that we adhered to for efficiency of communication was the diegesis of puzzles, things that emerge from the world of the room uh, without coming from the outside, without indicating that they uh, were created by somebody not within that world. When the world has an internal logic like that, um, objects and reasons for encoding emerge naturally from it. And again, good, good puzzles tell you in their design how to solve themselves, so it makes sense. Um, I'll walk you through this one pretty quick. In one of the puzzles, you break into a locked bookshelf finding a set of books. Um, what information do you have about them immediately? They, they were locked behind a sort of censoring unit, and on, on their covers it says they've been taken from the Argovian Library. Um, but they all have titles. You don't actually need to know the titles to solve the puzzle, which you don't know at that time. But if you look, they're all books that are among the most frequently banned books in our own society and have themes relating to the overarching themes of our room. So maybe you try ordering them alphabetically, but that doesn't work. However, you start to see other details emerging. You can look at the Dewey Decimal labels, the little tabs on the side. Those are not in alphabetical order when the titles are aligned, but you can see that they have the beginning and ends of a sentence. So placing them in that order reveals the code, the jungle, page 237. Uh, in, in the actual puzzle room, you turn to that page in the book, uh, and there's a marking on the page, a sort of faint indentation, um, which is the place where you would put a library card with cutouts over the words. This is spoilers as well, in case you're ever planning to visit. Um, but if you haven't found it already, the, you know, in the jacket of the book is the library card. All of the books have that pocket, but only one is holding the card. Uh, and knowing that it's a library book suggests the presence of that card. Um, however, actually, this is a kind of a funny thing, um, but it's becoming an issue because fewer and fewer people who are playing the room use the Dewey Decimal System in libraries. Uh, same goes for the typewriter and cassette tape player in the room. The audience is totally aging out of it. and, and sometimes just straight up does not know how to use it. Um, so yeah, you put, you put the card on there, it aligns with a number solution. Um, within that room, there's only one place to enter a four-digit number, so you immediately know, know where it goes. Um, or in searching, it becomes obvious as soon as you've found the four-digit hole. Uh, this is also the first instance of censorship in that world that you encounter. So in this one puzzle, it set you up to understand the nature of the world, why people might be paranoid enough to hide puzzles all around their propaganda office, uh, that kind of stuff. The solution for this gives you access to another higher security level, so you keep opening up deeper and deeper secrets as you progress. So as a player, you're gaining dominance over that world, and when it's done right, you don't even question that this is the right and just arrangement of the world because you're the star of it. So I'll say, like, one of the things that we really tried hard to do was make it so that people never had to read anything. We did a lot of work setting up the world to make it feel like it had its own inherent logic so that we never had to state any of that stuff in words. We wanted to convey as much as possible without distracting people from the sense of presence in the room and their urgency in working against the timer. So that meant designing something cohesive with a complicated backstory that informed our design choices without actually putting that backstory in. Uh, we made sure that all of the puzzles were moving the action forward and giving you a sense of progression, because you are the hero. And we designed character interactions to change the game state in very specific ways with minimal dialogue. Um, that's because in these kind of situations, people remember how they felt, not words that they've heard, and especially not words that they've read. Uh, so interacting with a human makes it very much more real even more so because they're in that flow state where the efficiency of information becomes really important. You're speaking directly to the brain by putting a human face on it. We reduced um, all of the character interaction to essentially one line every 15 minutes the entire hour that you're in there. 
Um, and so I'll, I'll sort of talk through it. Uh, when you first enter the room, you know that you're, you're investigating a character who's gone missing. It's their office. You've been sent in um, as a secret agent. They were deep undercover, uh, working to sabotage propaganda from within. So that's all the information that you're given. Uh, as soon as you get in, your first task uh, unlocks an audio recording found in a locked desk drawer, which teaches you maybe about the character's paranoia, the technology that this world is using, their possessions that are in their desk, that kind of stuff. Then your first interaction with that character comes a few steps later. You change the security level clearance on a key card, which you send to a prearranged hiding spot that was indicated in that recording. Uh, that alerts that character to your presence. And I mean, obviously, this is not somebody reacting in real time. It's all set up in advance. Um, but story-wise, they suddenly become aware that you're in their office and you're there to help them. So they send back a handwritten note asking for your help escaping the building, along with a coded puzzle that uses the typewriter. Uh, that also teaches you more about technology, about encoding and spycraft, that kind of thing. Um, that puzzle gives you access to a security system, which you use to trace a guard's path through the space. And this is told through video. Entering the solution sends the path to your, the character that you're helping, who uses that information to sneak out and avoid the guard. You watch this is happening on a screen um, that's totally silent. But then at that point, the character betrays you. They're going to get themselves out of the building, but you're on your own. And so they tell you directly the first time that they're actually speaking to you, uh, and this is, is told via video with an audio recording that plays, that they've left um, an electromagnetic pulse device hidden in their office. So now it's up to you to activate it, escape the building, and get out. So with each step of the story, your goals change, you learn more about the world, and the stakes are raised. And that was done with really only a couple hundred written or spoken words. So how does that affect us in VR? In some cases, it's the difference of what can be done only physically versus in a digital environment. Um, padlocks are a fantastic example of this. Uh, these are things that are extremely limited by physical realities because there's really only so many types of padlocks in the world, and a lot of them are very, very easy to break. Um, this one specifically is a sliding one, uh, and to reset it, you have to click it twice. So there's a, a sort of debate that we had when we were trying to figure out whether to introduce this into our room. Uh, do you put something in there that tells people how to reset it for when they mess it up, when they're actually like in the game playing it? Because that's a little weird, right? Like if it's your own office, you don't need instructions to open your own padlock. Or do you pull it out at the beginning say, OK, you're going to encounter this padlock. Here's how it operates, hoping that they remember when they actually encounter it, but removing the sort of moment of joy of realization when they figure out the sliding mechanism, how it connects to the puzzle, and so on. Because again, the, the, the joy of the puzzle, the difficulty of it, is based on how much information you have about it to begin with. Um, so if you know that you're going to encounter this, you're going to be looking for what it applies to. Um, and of course, in VR, padlocks could be anything because it's magic. Uh, but there's also a technological benefit to this. Um, if you're letting people fill in the blanks uh, design-wise, if you're making it so that it's not super complicated, uh, if you're using an emotional reaction to carry the weight of a story, you don't have to make as much stuff. Um, and in VR, that means less stuff to model, less environments to design. So you can use these principles to make dev time more efficient and a more positive experience for the people who are actually in there because they're not laden with too much stuff. Um, playing with, uh, with the imagination in this way is something you see a lot in black box theater, for example. Um, people don't, really don't need a full set to enjoy what they're seeing or for it to be real to them. Uh, there's a Nicole Kidman film called Dogville where it's um, set on a stage where houses, the outlines are taped out. So it becomes this really interesting extra dimension of communication when you can see into the house next to you and people are pretending to not see the terrible things that are happening, but everything is totally visible all at the same time. Of course, that's done without ever instructing people on how that works. People just get it. So this is tapping directly into the imagination. Like, we don't really need hyperrealism because we have that kind of magic. It's engaging directly with the mind's eye. And so a lot of that comes down to reducing the already overloaded cognitive burden of the players by suggesting information and speaking to the subconscious rather than putting it all up in their faces. So here's a question that I ask myself a lot. Uh, does this matter? 
And will people even notice if you're trying these kind of design techniques? Um, I use this example because it's from ARGS. Um, there's always somebody behind the curtain in any sort of designed experience, right? Sometimes people really badly want to look behind that curtain. It's kind of inevitable. Um, but it's our job as entertainers to sort of try and prevent that from happening generally because it takes people out of that immersion. When it's done right, it's completely invisible to people. And that's because it's working. So that sometimes makes people believe that it's not important, and it often makes people believe that it's easy, but it really isn't. Um, so why should we care? Why should we put in the effort for that? Uh, VR has been around a long time, but you know, really only recently has the technology kind of caught up to our imaginations. We have a really interesting opportunity to engage with the mind's eye in a language that actually doesn't exist yet, which I think is super exciting. Uh, anything that we make now is going to set the standard for everything that comes later. So we need to be working to make the foundations of the kind of work we wish to see in the future. Right now, there's a lot of VR stuff that speaks directly to the lizard brain, stuff that plays on claustrophobia, the startle response, your, your sort of sense of vertigo. And it's really fun to explore that. Um, but it's resulting in an image of VR that looks to people on the outside of the industry kind of like this. Um, <laughs> yeah. One of the most common questions that we get for escape rooms and that I see with people interacting with VR is, is it scary? And being scary is fine. I love scary. Scary is really fun. Um, the middle, middle gif is of uh, Erika Ishii, who has an awesome show called Scaredy Cats, where she plays scary games. Um, so I'm sorry for using that gif as the, as the example of b people being scared in VR. Um, but the human brain is such an amazing and complicated and beautiful thing, and scary is such a small part of that. We talk about VR as a medium of infinite possibility, and when we do that, we're talking about feeling and experiencing those infinite things. Speaking in the language of the brain is what gives us such an incredible palette. So how do we best take care of the people inside our experiences? Uh, how do we show them respect? How do we transport them, entertain them, give them magic in a way that's never been experienced before? Uh, these are the questions that it's our responsibility to find answers for, and it's what we've been tasked with. Uh, with the rise of industrial automation and self-driving cars, we can expect increased leisure time and demand for entertainment. Uh, the answers that we find for this right now, that we prioritize and that we decide to pursue, are what are going to influence future generations of makers. Uh, so together, let's work and make magic happen. Thank you. I don't know if there's questions or if people just want to come and meet in the wrap-up lounge across the way and chat about this kind of stuff. I can go over there. Oh, I'll, I'll yeah. ask you a question. Or do you want to go first? Uh, you can go first. Okay, great. Hey, so um, what do you think about the intersection or the possible intersection mm -hmm. of interactive theater like Sleep No More mm -hmm. and puzzle-oriented uh, things like Room Escape? Like, uh, you could make an argument that they would go together great, or you could see them as being incompatible mm -hmm. in some fundamental way. And I'm curious what your viewpoint is on that. Sure. Uh, so the question is, can, can interactive theater like Sleep No More integrate lessons from puzzle design or, or maybe puzzle experiences? Um, Actually, Sleep No More tried an interactive sort of thing. I think it was a collaboration with the MIT Media Lab or Game Lab, I could be wrong. Um, but they had a thing where the mask that you wear throughout the entire experience had an RFID unit in it that would interact with the environment. Um, so as you move through the space, which is totally open, it takes place in a six-story warehouse, um, and there's no stage. The entire space is the stage. The characters are continually present in that space. Um, and the show loops three times, so you're following them around that whole time. So there was a second layer with people who had those special masks. Um, books would fly off the shelf, and you could interact with a typewriter and stuff. Uh, but it was a completely curated thing. You were just following a, a set path. Um, and I think that one of the main reasons they ended up not implementing it is because people wanted more agency within that. Um, Sleep No More, the way that that set is designed, uh, everything in it is real. So if there's like a jacket hanging up, you can look in the pocket and there's like a letter in there that's from the world of Macbeth. Uh, it's all real. 
um, which is really fun because if I, like I'm an exploring type game player, so I just want to poke around. I want to look in every drawer. Like it takes me a really long time to play games like Genmu because I want to look inside every cabinet. Um, but I would find that frustrating because the story that they had chosen was about saving somebody who is not saved in the end. And so like that was a bad experience for people. They wanted to have more choice. So it's possible, but maybe not in that context. I was wondering if you had any insight on like bad escape room design because as I mean I play a lot of video games I sort of I think after playing 20 years of games you sort of know that things like respawning enemies are typically not great uh, but I was at an escape room in uh, Wisconsin and there was a puzzle that dealt there basically there were these keys that were colored and they were laid out on the counter and basically like we could pick up and move these keys and we had forgotten what order they were originally in and then later on like 30 minutes later in the puzzle like right the, the, the timer was counting down it the final puzzle relied on those keys their original position and we ended up not being able to solve it. So I was wondering if we thought that was bad design, but I mean, we're not. But anyway, I was just curious what you think about stuff like that. No, I, I, I think that, yeah, that is, that's poorly designed because you noticed it, right? You were frustrated by it. Um, there's a certain level of frustration that can be expected in those environments, uh, which is fun, but past a certain point, it's no longer fun. Um, and so actually, I'll, I'll share something that's just happened this week. Um, I designed the Resident Evil room that's currently on tour uh, in collaboration with I Am 8-Bit. Um, so I was in Portland where the first one was, and I worked really closely with getting that one set up. But I have not been involved in the running of the other sites. Um, another one that just launched in a different city, I, you know, I, I wasn't involved. I wasn't there to say, like, fix this or fix this. And on their opening night, a lot of stuff was broken. That's when all of the reviewers came through. Um, yeah, great, right? Um, but, it's, you know, that's fair. When the design, when the environment doesn't speak to you, when it's broken down, that's the game. That's the whole game. And it becomes a bad game in that case. Uh, and one of the things in there is exactly that same sort of stuff. Uh, I'm assuming that nobody here uh, is going to go play, but if you are, cover your ears. Um, one of the puzzles involves removing picture frames from a wall, and there needed to be something in there that indicated which wall that had come from. And so each of the walls has a different artistic theme. Oh yeah, I see you covering. <laughs> Sorry, keep, keep, almost done. Yeah, so when, when you pull that off, if you weren't paying attention in that moment, you can sort of match it back with the theme. And I think even that as a sort of basic level is kind of essential. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the talk. That was awesome. Um, I am curious, so I feel like when we're talking about taking care of our players in an experience like this that's very collaborative, one of the ways that um, it's easy to feel not taken care of maybe is, is socially, like that maybe your teammates are solving the puzzles and you're getting left behind. And I'm wondering what your approach is to facilitating uh, a good collaborative experience in escape rooms. Uh, so the question is about... Um, as a player, you mean, as, as teammates, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so, so as a team person, as a player within it with other people, like how can it be a good collaborative experience? Um, because I do like competitive uh, puzzle stuff for fun, I've had a lot of like weed training as a group. Um, there's a lot of sort of natural inclinations that you have to learn to overcome. Uh, like as an example, um, sometimes there will be like a Sudoku puzzle or something. You only need to solve just a little bit of it in order to get the solution to get to the next thing. Your natural reaction to that is to want to solve the entire Sudoku, right? Um, but you don't need to. So be, to be able to sort of train yourself to skip over that is like a major part of it. Um, and in that same way, knowing the strengths and weaknesses of your other teammates is very important. Um, often you need somebody to be able to step back and watch and see what's going on, um, to notice when something's been found on that other side that goes over there, that kind of stuff. Uh, we do a lot of corporate team building and it's extremely revealing about the sort of places you would or would not want to work. <laughs> hey, thanks for your talk. Um, so you were talking about preparing the players for suspension of disbelief. Mm -hmm. Um, and I noticed that sometimes um, escape rooms will use something like a pre-spiel or a movie to set up the whole theming for that. Um, I was wondering if you had any best practices for that in escape rooms and how that might relate to a VR player who's going into a virtual experience for the first time. Sure. 
so the question is sort of about priming people for the experience um, with a video or, or whatever else. Um, and I think it's, it's going to be a little bit different for a physical thing versus a virtual one. Um, best practices for escape rooms, I, mm, again, my preference is going to always be heavily on the narrative side. So I don't want to just be told, hey, welcome to this place, here's the deal. Like, it, you know, I want it to be in character, revealing enough that it seems mysterious, but really intriguing. You need to be given a sort of purpose or mission. Um, I think it's going to be very different in VR, though, because of directed attention. It's kind of easier when you're not just sort of like standing shuffling around when there's like obvious cues that will draw you into stuff. Um, but I, I mean, the setup should be the same. Like, you should know where you are and what you're doing, at least, that kind of stuff, yeah. Thanks. Um, so I have a question that you, you touched briefly on um, immersive theater in addition to competitive escape rooms. Because um, you don't see this as much in the competitive thing, but I'm wondering with the uh, things like, you know, players getting into a flow state, players getting into survival mode, et cetera, um, do you have any thoughts about how getting players to perform in like a role play capacity? Like if you know everyone goes into a room and you know you're Professor Plum, you're Miss Peacock, etc. Um, how do players react to that? I guess. So the question basically is, how do you make people role play? <laughs> basically, um, I personally really don't enjoy role playing. Um, I'm not a performer. I'm, this kind of stuff makes me feel really awkward. Uh, so I try and avoid it at all costs generally. But often in a group there will be somebody who is like totally all about that and so we just sort of like will push them forward into it. If I know that that's what I'm going to engage in beforehand and I have some preparation, that makes it much, much easier for me. Um, if you go over to SF MoMA for the exhibition that they have right there, uh, there's a game running right now called Bad News which is um, you interacting with an actor who's improvising based on um, characters in a town that you choose your sort of path through it. Um, you, you say, I'm gonna speak to this person, the curtain comes back, it's the actor, they, you know, they, they talk to you, you get information from them, the curtain closes. So like, that's about the right level of role play for me, where I'm, you know, I had to come up with like, my occupation and, and a set, sort of cover story. But because I was being coached through it and because I knew what it was going in, I was comfortable enough to at least do that level. So I, th I think it's just about preparation. And part of that, sorry, just to clarify, was that um, you got there and then they had you come up with an occupation and things as part of the experience to prime you? Uh, so the, the premise of it is that you're delivering the bad news of someone's death to somebody in the town. Um, and that's all that I knew when I came in. Uh, you're actually, you're a mortician's assistant or so part of the city morgue. Um, and they said, you're going to encounter a lot of people. Some of them might be reluctant to speak to you. So what are you going to tell them? And, you know, you kind of have to weave something together. They suggested things too, though, because I was like, oh, you know, I'm not, that's not my thing. So thank you. Thanks. So I think that's all of the time for questions, but I'm gonna go over to the little wrap-up lounge in case anybody wants to chat further. Thank you so much for coming.